Palais d'Action in Ballet, Ballet History. What is this? This is Ballet is telling a story. Story without any words, based on gestures, body movements, and the body language. Now, the body language, the interest in the body language is not new. There is always the exploration of the body, exploitation of the body. How can the body speak, as I'm doing now with my hands and with my body? Actually, I was thinking, instead of speaking to you, I should be dancing this lecture. <laughs> to, prove, to prove that Shakespeare can be without words. <laughs> but I'm not doing it. Yeah? Okay. So yeah, here we see some very famous ballet d'action choreographers. As you see, their birthdays, death dates. But among them, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, Jean-Jean Lauber is a little bit more significant, comparatively speaking. Why? There is an attempt of him doing Antony and Cleopatra. He has a ballet called Cleopatra. Now, the research are, uh, is it only the love affair of Antony and Cleopatra, or is it Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra translated into ballet? But as he was hailed by David Garrick, the Shakespeare of dance, probably he made use of the play also not very definite, but if it's so, then he's the very first choreographer attempting to translate Shakespeare into ballet language. Now, when we come to the 18th century, we see, amazingly, Macbeth as the ballet, then we see Romeo and Juliet, and then we see Hamlet in these different years by very different famous choreographers. Then when we move along to the 19th century, now 19th century is a specific century, of course, in the world history theater also, because uh, in theatrical productions, very, uh, various changes are taking place. Spectacle, although spectacle has been very, very important all these centuries, gaining a lot of importance, and in theater we see variety of productions. Then we also see the ballet versions of various Shakespearean plays. For example, Coriolanus. Again, Romeo and Juliet. Then Macbeth again. And then Othello. And then The Tempest. And A uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. The funny thing about this ballet, Midsummer Night's Dream, is that whenever A Midsummer Night's Dream as a play was produced, it was almost like a ballet too, with very uh, they're using the, all the theater gimmicks and theatrical effects to produce the play. It's actually a very difficult play to produce. Now, when we come to the 20th century, we, of course, theater is establishing itself. Various movements are taking place as well. Now, we have to remember, throughout the history of theater or Shakespeare productions, as uh, Lawrence Rowe mentioned, wars or epidemics or social changes or class changes, uh, the desire of the new classes coming and expecting new genres from theater also affect the development of theatrical productions. So of course, here we see um, Shakespeare gaining another importance where you have choreographers attempting to balletize Shakespeare, but now ballet has gained an independent status as well in this case. And then we see, for example, a play called Cross Garter, which is taken from Twelfth Night, focusing on Margolio, as the name implies. He was the cross garter figure in the famous comedy Twelfth Night. Then we have The Merry Wives of Windsor. Now, 1942 Hamlet is a little bit important compared to the other rallies, because it's a mimo drama. It's one act by Robert Helpman. Robert Helpman, who was also an actor himself and a dancer. But here, when he is producing, he produced this mimo drama. He was the famous influence there, for example, being Freudian uh, interpretations or approaches towards plays or other issues. So you see that kind of influence in that mimo drama as well. Then we 
we have a Martha Graham, 1950. Martha Graham is a famous American dancer, a contemporary dancer, of course. She's not around now, but she attempted King Lear and under the name of Eye of Anguish. I didn't go into the details of modern ballets of Shakespeare, actually, but that was a significant one, so I put it in the list. Then we have the Taming of the Shrew, and then we have Much Ado About Nothing. Among the 20th century uh, balletized versions of Shakespeare's plays, the most frequently staged ones are Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Othello, The Taming of the Shrew, and Midsummer Night's Dream. So I'd like to give some more information about these plays. The most famous Romeo and Juliet ballet productions are 1938 Lavrovsky production in Bruno, 1955 Ashton, 1955 Rodriguez Productions, and the 1958 Franco Production, 1965 Kenneth Macmillan Production, and 1971 Noel Mayer Production, also the 1971 Rodriguez Production in Ankara. That was in Ankara, or in the Turkish ballet history, the Shakespeare ballets in Turkish ballet history, the first Shakespeare ballet in 1971, Romeo and Juliet by Rodriguez. Later, there were other Romeo and Juliet's. There was Taming of Kishu, Midsummer Night's Dream, even Othello in the Turkish ballet history, balletized as well. Now, among Romeo and Juliet choreographers, we have a Lavrovsky Prokofiev uh, collaboration, and this was a legendary production where we see a legendary dance couple, Galina Ulanova, and Sergeyev dancing. And before the 1965 Kenneth Macmillan production of Royal Ballet in England. Now Kenneth Macmillan had in mind a different dancer. Mm -hmm. He was he sh he wanted another dancer to do Juliet, but in the 1965 production, uh, legendary couples um, um, Margot Fontaine and Nureyev danced the ballet and the films were made and the EVs can, are available of this legendary couple who are not around, of course, with us. Now, Kenneth Macmillan was very faithful to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, so was Lavrovsky, and in fact, when Lavrovsky was collaborating with Prokofiev, the famous composer, to produce the ballet, they had lots of problems. They were in intensely working on Shakespeare, doing research, but Prokofiev uh, couldn't stand the idea that Juliet was too late waking up and seeing dead to Romeo. He wanted to have a happy ending, but that was out of question. Now Roski said, no way, we can't do that. But as you know, or as those of you who know about the adaptations of Shakespeare, there were quite a number of attempts to have happy endings to his plays, but in this ballet, it couldn't be done. So in the ballet of, uh, in the ballet language, we see the stages of their love, the Romeo and Juliet love developing, and the um, other characters, Tybalt, or the nurse, or Mercutio, again portrayed in the dance language, especially Mercutio's mercurial character, in dance language, comes about most successfully. Similarly, the mind parts of Friar Lawrence and Lady Capulet come about very successfully as well. Now, among the famous Hamlet ballets, it's rather amazing to have Hamlet as a ballet, you may think. How can you have Hamlet without to be or not to be? I mean, how could you dance that? But um, before the 1942 <laughs> mind of drama, you have a 1934 Nijinska production. Nijinska a lady choreographer dancing the lead part. So uh, we have Sarah Bernhardt famous doing it. We just heard that we had Fatma Girik doing Hamlet <laughs> as a woman, but we have a dancer doing uh, Hamlet as a woman as well. Then we have Konstantin Sergeyev or Chabukiani, other choreographers attempting to do Hamlet and John Neumeyer, Hamlet connotations, 
1976. Now, we have Othello productions as well in that case. We have one called Bermur's Pama. As the name implies, it's in a Paman structure, and because of that, Jose Limon has done that, there are, there's only, uh, there are only two couples, uh, Othello, there's Limona, and Iago, and Emilia. So in a Paman structure. Uh, but Chabukiani, another choreographer, followed the play closely <coughs> to produce a full life Hamlet. Now, the taming of the shrew, I think that this uh, is a ballet. Uh, in the play itself, you have such scenes where sometimes you think, we can do without words. We must have the body language here, okay? So it's a favorite play of choreographers who translated the play into ballet language, and John Krakos, to uh, the 1969 two-act ballet, is the most famous one. There are other taming of truth, but his was the most famous one, which also came to Ankara, that version, was performed by the Ankara State Ballet. But the ballet highlighted a rough comedy, and then juxtaposed uh, uh, Caterina Petruccio and Bianca Lucentio couples. So in the ballet, you could see this in the pas de deux, how different these two couples and their relationships are were. Okay. Now, A Midsummer Night's Dream is, as I said, a very challenging play to produce as a play. And there are different attempts of Midsummer Night's Dream as plays. And I'm sure among you, some I heard that students have performed A Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, twice. You see? It's, uh, and you must have experienced that challenge and uh, what happened during the productions, I can imagine. But of course, the most challenging thing is to know the words and dance about. So we see uh, Ashton. So Frederick Ashton, I mentioned, from the English uh, Royal Ballet again, um, doing the ballet in 1964. Now, 1964 is an again significant year. Why? It's the 400th year of celebrations of Shakespeare's birthday. So Frederick Ashton, being the most famous choreographer of English ballet history, was commissioned to do this. He has one act, the dream. And I will, I will be showing you tiny little scenes from these. And there he was focusing on the comedy and uh, the paddle of Titania and Oberon and Bottom transforming into an ass was well, these very, very famous scenes were very legendary scenes. Now, John Neumeyer, another choreographer um, who is alive now, Romeo, he has different versions of Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet. He also attempted a Midsummer Night's Dream in 1977 for the Hamburg Ballet and then 1993 for the Bavarian State Ballet, which was revived in 2013, and this year in the ballet festival week. I was very lucky to be there watching this Neumeyer production, uh, The Midsummer Night's Dream. So I will be showing you a pirated edition of a trailer <laughs> that I got. I hope I am successful able to be able to share it with you. So I was very lucky to see that. And John Neumeyer used Mendelssohn music, but he also was aware of the eerie forest atmosphere of the fairies. And very difficult scene for productions. <coughs> what should we do with these fairies? Should they be flying about? Should they have wings? Should they wear tights? Should they be genderless? It's very difficult to decide to have exact fairies because they're quite considerably mischievous characters. So he used Ligeti music. It's an eerie music. And then he used that for the mechanicals, um, but barrel organ music. They can use those selected Verdi pieces. And these, with the choice of the scores, the fairies and the mechanicals were successfully presented. And of course, there was the uh, Mendelssohn score, the famous wedding march, as everybody knows. Sometimes you get tired of it. And now, in the 21st century, now, this um, is the period where we have in theater all sorts of things happening. It doesn't have to be Shakespeare turning into ballet. 
But any any theater show, any play, anything you watch on stage can have variety of things. We have all the technology contributing to it. We have our laptops. We have digitalized versions. We have. Uh, laser shows, we have video projections on backstage uh, going on at the back uh, part of the stage. Um, holograms, yes, we have that as well. All sorts of things happening, and as this happens in the Institute Theatre, of course it affects the ballet productions also. And those choreographers attempting Shakespeare are under the influence of all these possibilities of new theatre gimmicks. So when we see uh, a Hamlet uh, by Stephen Mills, um, he was in an interview, he says he wanted to approach the play in a different manner by starting at the end, while Hamlet is dying, wounded by a poison blade. And he made use of flashback techniques because of that. And he left off the Rosenkranz Gildenstern and Gravedigger themes. Sometimes you wonder, how can you have Hamlet without the grave digger scene? But he did it, okay? Now, in, um, in 2001, Bigonzetti, uh, well, that's not here, but he balletized in its summer night street. He focused on glacier relationships in the play. And then in 2004, this is a year after uh, the war in Iraq. So David Gordon, this choreographer, approached Henry the with a postmodern approach in an hour-long ballet to present the in or uh, morality or immorality of war with seven dancers and a narrator. In 2007, Sasha Waltz balletized Romeo and Juliet, setting the play in an other universe, omitting Evolio, Paris, Mercutio, Tibble, leaving Romeo and Juliet and the Friar accompanied by a chorus. And she's very much interested in this operatic approach, she's a very famous choreographer. She adapted doing Romeo and Juliet this way. <coughs> then we have um,